Well, hi, everyone. It has been a minute, uh, but thank you for sticking with us during our brief holiday-infused hiatus. You are listening once more to Certified Forgotten, the only podcast run by two dudes named Matt. And also, we talk about uh, all of the best horror films that have five or fewer reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, but mostly it's the Matt thing that I think you're sort of tuned in for. My name is Matt Monigle. I am a uh, film critic and writer based out of Austin, Texas. I am joined, as always, by my co-host and partner in crime, Matt Donato, based out of sunny Los Angeles. How you doing, buddy? Doing okay. Uh, also, I challenge the fact that we are the only podcast hosted by two dudes named Matt. I feel like that's no. most every podcast in the entire world. I think, like, I, somehow I think even, like, my brother, my brother and me has two Matts in there that we just don't know about. So we're pretty ubiquitous, I think. Oh, Monogal, I'm tired. Me too. But we're going to sp- we're going to spike our fucking energy level because we have a guest on the show today that we've been trying to get on here for months, um, partially because we're bad at scheduling, but also because we've known that we wanted to get this person on the, the podcast for months. So, Donato, will you please do the the appropriate introductions? Absolutely. I'm very excited because this is also something we've been talking about for a long time to start bringing in film programmers. Uh, it's one thing to talk to journalists and reviewers, and we've all seen so many movies, but I really do think no one has seen more movies in our industry sphere than a programmer. So, this is hopefully the start of something that we'll be doing more of. And to start off our little programmer series here, we have Mr. Luke Mullen, who you all know if you've gone to Fantastic Fest as the big, lovable teddy bear programmer and head of client, ex- uh, sorry, client experience. Wow, still my day job. Uh, head of filmmaker experience. Luke, how's it going? Welcome. Thank you. Oh, man, thanks. I'm uh, very honored to be here. So, look, I'm excited to have you on the show um, because, you know, I know that you're a very talented film programmer. I know that you cheat at Twilight Imperium. I know a little (laughs) bit about you, but I, you know, like a lot of the people that I kind of encounter in the industry, I don't get an opportunity to kind of hear their their origin stories and kind of how they first fell in love with film and, and got started in the industry. So as we always do with our guests, let's walk it all the way back to the beginning of beginnings and let's talk about kind of what lit the fire for film and particularly genre film for you. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in a very small town in, uh, Indiana and, uh, I mean, my earliest, a lot of my earliest memories are, uh, film related, you know, uh, falling asleep on my dad's chest, watching star Wars with him was definitely a big, I don't know, uh, cathartic moment for me and, and, uh, inspired a, a, a lifelong love of cinema. Uh, my dad in particular was uh, a big movie fan. And, you know, this is certainly, he, he has wide ranging tastes now, but especially, you know, when I was growing up in the eighties, it was very mainstream and, you know, growing up in a small town in Indiana was, was very mainstream taste. And so I think, you know, it probably took really until college before I, I kind of started being more aware of, of foreign cinema and independent cinema and, um, you know, stuff that wasn't playing at the local multiplex. And so, uh, you know, I, I kind of feel like I got a late start in that regard. You know, I'm definitely kind of jealous watching kids grow up now that are watching stuff on Shutter and and really becoming more aware of just how widespread the movie industry is. And and that's part of why I love what you guys are doing with this podcast, because there are so many movies, you know, especially as a programmer, you see so many that just sort of fall through the cracks. And, uh, you know, for whatever reason, they just don't, you know, they don't get picked up or they don't get wider distribution and and there's, you know, some real gems out there and some really talented filmmakers that that sort of languish in obscurity as a result of that. So uh, I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing here to kind of shine a light on some of those smaller titles. Uh, we're not too proud to take some praise. Thank you, Luke. Appreciate that. Uh, question for you kind of along those lines, because uh, we've talked about, you know, Donato and I have eerily similar upbringings in terms of our relationship to the horror genre. And I know that in my household, we didn't even have a TV for most of my middle school years. Um, probably until I was in high school. So I kind of relate to the idea of, of coming to the game late and certainly like lighting the fire about discovering stuff um, later than most people did. You know, I just kind of watched what was there. So what do you think that kind of those kind of early experiences did for you in terms of your, you know, that desire or that ability to go out and like find things? When did you start finding yourself like pushing beyond just, you know, God bless him, but Leonard Malton's, you know, the the stuff in Leonard Malton's movie book or the stuff that was playing at the multiplex, like the things that that kind of what you knew is the established commercial canon. When did you find yourself digging into sort of, you know, the darker side, the more fun side? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, it was uh, it was definitely college before 
you know, before I was kind of aware of that wider world. And, you know, I had several different experiences kind of all at once that, that really pushed me to, like you said, to seek out uh, those films because they were out there. I just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of them and I wasn't going out and, and really seeking them until college. Um, so uh, this is kind of just a, a quick little aside. Uh, my roommate in college was Andrew WK's little brother. Um, it was a lovely man named Patrick Wilkes Creer, who uh, was uh, like the assistant men's golf coach at Michigan for a while and now works at like a private academy. And anyways, uh, he's a delightful human being. Very similar career path for both of you. Very A hundred percent. Yeah. No. And, and families for sure. But he was really good friends with one of the humanities professors that had uh, an apartment in Chicago. We both went to Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, home of David Letterman, the only person that ever went to Ball State. Well, and Papa John, but he's racist. So. <laughs> yeah, small, small town uh, public university. Anyway, so he was really good friends with this humanities professor. I didn't really know her, but she had this apartment on the south side of Chicago and would let us go up for, for long weekends and stay uh, stay with her at her apartment. So you know, I went to the music box. Yeah, we, we did a lot of things. We went to, you know, the Fields Museum and Shed's Aquarium and had lovely Chicago weekends. But going to the music box was really the thing that kind of expanded my horizons. You know, I saw Casablanca for the first time. You know, I, you know, part of that mainstream thing, too, is not just uh, not being aware of, of foreign or independent cinema, but also just not being aware of, you know, the history of cinema, really, and not uh, not really having any desire to watch older film, especially, you know, that old. And so that was a big experience. I mean, it, you know, people always ask, what's your favorite movie? If they, if people hear that you're a movie person of some degree and that, you know, as we all know, it's a, that's a tough question and there's not ever really one answer, but if I'm giving an answer, like Casablanca is my answer, that movie, uh, it remains so witty and quick and just, it's such a great story. And I, and especially when you think about <laughs> one of the things I love about Casablanca is that the world war two wasn't over. Like we were still in the midst of world war two and that movie came out. And so you think about that when you watch it and you're like, yeah, like we watch it now and assume like, well, of course, you know, everybody was, you know, for the allies or whatever, but the, the war wasn't decided at the time, you know, it came out in, I don't remember like 41 or so, but, uh, but yeah, like the war wasn't over yet. I'm like 99% sure if I'm wrong, we're going to edit this all out. I'm pretty sure that's, I could be wrong. Did we, intro- did we introduce you as a World War II historian? I don't think so. We said you're a film programmer, so you're fine. Um, so yeah, I saw. I remember going to see uh, Henneke's cachet at the music box, and that was a big, like, holy shit moment. And, I, you know, I may have been a little more predisposed to see that one in particular because I think I got extra credit for it because uh, <laughs> my, my bachelor's is in French, which was only because I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want to spend like six years in college and I knew I could get out in four years with a French major. So that's, that's what I did. But anyway, so I, you know, I spent these trips and I would go see these, you know, these smaller films at the music box. And then, uh, you know, Patrick and I got really interested in film like that. you know, I remember we drove down to, uh, to Indianapolis when uh, Capote came out, the Philip Seymour Hoffman Capote. And we were just enamored with that film. Um, and so, you know, it's, you know, smaller independent titles and, and international titles uh, really didn't start to be something that I, that I was seeking out until my college years. And, and it just kind of sparked a lifetime love of all types of cinema. You know, it was just a, an expansion of my horizons. Well, fun fact, if you uh, want one more person who went to Ball State, uh, my mom graduated from Ball State. Uh, I, believe, no I, believe, I believe Masters, I've, uh, obviously a little before your time. But uh, yeah, I don't know. My mom was Ball State, uh, got her master in speech uh, pathology and uh, very, very much. Uh, you got one more there who's not a racist. So congratulations. Hey, it's two to one now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I like that you kind of put it that way, Luke, because I think I think everybody sort of reaches anybody who, who starts to really get serious about film. You, you reach this point where you realize that you're kind of confronting film history as like a series of Russian nesting dolls. Right. Because you're like, I like this movie and I'd like to understand it better. But if I want to understand it better, I have to watch these 10 movies that both informed the actual technical production of it and also inspired the filmmaker. And if I want to understand those 10 movies, then I have to watch each of the 10 movies that inspired each of them. And it becomes this, this, you know, old biblical process of like begat and begat and back. And you're, you're tracing it back all the way to the beginning of film history. It's, it's daunting. And the easiest thing in the world to do, especially as, as a young cinephile is just to like, arbitrarily draw lines and say, I'm just not going to go farther back than here because otherwise I like, I have to, I have to chase every thread of film history simultaneously all the time. And I think part of the maturation process for me and, and for a lot of people is kind of 
figuring out what it's okay to admit that you don't know about or, or the areas where you will kind of consolidate history and strength and the areas where you're going to fall a little bit behind. When you're like 18, 19 and really starting to get serious about cinema and taking college classes and stuff, that's a really, that's a lot. That's a lot for you to basically say, hey, like if you want to do this right, it's going to be all of your life forever for the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think, I really like what you said about, you know, the rushing nesting dolls and big hats and stuff. And I think part of that for me was, you know, what, you know, I think at our age, I think we all sort of grew up at the right age for Tarantino. And so, you know, Tarantino's films were, were big in the mainstream, but we're doing things that were uh, very different from mainstream films, but then also realizing like, okay, he's borrowing from, and I mean, obviously other people have, have different words for it, but borrowing from so many different films. And, and it was, it was daunting, but then, you know, it, it led me to chase down stuff like, you know, city on fire and blood spattered bride and uh, twisted nerve, you know, the, the Haley Mills film that he gets the, like the, um, the musical cue from, from Kill Bill from, and, uh, and, and then, you know, it's funny cause sometimes you'll go back and watch other stuff and not realize that you're going to, you know, kind of stumble upon something that you already know. So a big thing, uh, that happened like that for me was the first time I watched blowout by Brian De Palma's blowout, which in all honesty for me is a top 10 film. I think that film is a fucking masterpiece. It's so well done. And, uh, the big climactic shot, you know, Tarantino is holding Nancy Allen, I want to say. And it's a, you know, it's a spinning shot and, you know, there's like the big flag in the background because it's like a 4th of July event. Um, and it's, you know, this music cue kicks in and it's the same music cue that's playing in Death Proof. Uh, the Jungle Julia is like texting in the back of the Texas Chili Parlor. And so it was just like, holy shit, like it hit me in the face. Like I fucking know that music cue. And uh, so that was, I don't know, that was a nice little side for you guys. You're welcome. Well, I, I think, Monica, the way you said that, too, like, when is it okay to admit that we haven't seen anything? And I mean, I came to terms with that years ago, because we've always we've talked about all of our, you know, horror origins, and mine was very late and college for me as well was horror itself. So like, I came into this whole thing a lot later than people would expect. And it was very quick and very easy for me to recognize no matter what movie I post online saying I'm watching for the first time, somebody will drop in and just be like, you haven't seen that yet. And it's like, no, I haven't go fuck yourself. Like I, that doesn't make you a better cinephile for doing that. So like I came to terms with that pretty quickly. And I've, I've been very, very happy with being like, no, I haven't seen this. This is the first time I'm watching this classic. Like I just watched the changeling for the first time and, and like, oh, great, you know, great exactly. So like I'm 32 and I'm just seeing changeling for the first time, but like, I guarantee half the people saying like, Oh my God, you haven't seen the changeling. Haven't kept up with half the horror films I have in the last decade. So it's like, you have to pick your battles in weird ways. And like, unfortunately, historically is where I have the biggest blind spot, but we're all on different journeys. We do this every time. Like we we're all on different journeys. And like, that's the most fun part about sharing this communal horror experience. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I want to ask Luke, cause I know I've, I've read your liner notes. I know you're a very talented writer. I had, I know that's not necessarily the biggest piece of what you do, <laughs> but I'm curious, were you, were you writing about film in college too? Were you like doing essays and like taking film studies classes and the whole nine yards? Um, so I, uh, I took one, like, I think it was a European film class. Um, and it was really interesting. It was more of a discussion class, though. Um, I remember we had a really heated discussion about dirty, pretty things and whether or not yes. the like the creepy hotel guy kind of dangling a passport over Audrey Tattoo's head in exchange for sex, like whether or not that constituted rape. Like that was a huge discussion. I, I mean, obviously, this was like 2005 and things are we're in a much different world now. But, you know, just that very like. You know, he wasn't forcing himself on her, but he was, you know, he was holding her future in, in his hand. Like, so that was that was a big discussion that we had in that class. Um, but yeah, so that wasn't it, I didn't so much write. Um, I mean, very briefly, I dabbled in, in <laughs> I, I wouldn't call it film criticism per se. I mean, I submitted some anonymous reviews to Ain't It Cool News that got posted in back in the day. And I wrote for uh, Eric Davis and Scott Weinberg at some of the cinematical offshoots. Like mm. they had like horror squad and sci-fi squad for a few years. That's back in the, the annals of film critic history that have been well and truly forgotten probably for good reason. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I never was, uh, it was never my main job and I was never, I don't think particularly great at it. Well, what, what did, um, what path got you into your main job? Oh, like, right. So yeah, particularly <laughs> great. At. What, what was the kind of the transition in your post-college years where you found yourself gravitating towards programming? 
Right. So uh, a really good friend of mine um, from Ball State is a guy named Brian Salisbury. Um, when I graduated a year before he did, um, and you know, my parents had moved to North Carolina while I was in college, so I moved back home with them and got a job in in post production. I just kind of stumbled into, you know, it was the first job I got out of college. And he, his wife uh, went to LSU to get a master's. So he was down in Baton Rouge with her once he graduated and we had kept in touch. We were both, you know, very much into, you know, at the time, Ain't It Cool News and Cinematical and all the big movie blogs because he had kind of gone on the same path I had. I'm pretty sure he was in that same European film studies class with me. Um, And so he was also having that like, oh, there are movies outside the mainstream that I'm really interested in. And uh, around this time, the original Alamo Drafthouse on Colorado was shutting down. And so there were a bunch of like all the film critic sites were running like remembrances of this place. And we were uh, really curious and kind of enamored of it. And so I decided I was going to buy tickets for the last night at the original Alamo. Um, And so I had been like calling and uh, talking to the manager and they were like, well, we're not sure what we're going to do yet. We th- initially, the lady said, uh, I think we're only going to sell last night tickets to Fantastic Fest badge holders. And I was like, oh, that's cool. It's Fantastic Fest. And so she like, you know, she sent me the website. So I just bought two badges. You know, I was I was living at home. I had more <laughs> discretionary income <laughs> and uh, could just do that. And so I bought a couple badges because I thought I would need them. And then she was like, well, we're only going to sell them on site and they'll probably sell out on site before we're able to put them online. So I was like, well, fuck it. Let's go to Austin. So Brian and I came out to Austin and went to the original Alamo in Colorado. Herschel Gordon Lewis was there the night we were there and doing a double feature of uh, 2000 Maniacs and Blood Feast. That was a huge experience for us. Uh, We went and saw Death Proof. We went to the Texas Chili Parlor. Uh, We just kind of fell in love with Austin. And so I think that was like, I don't know, maybe May or June of 2007. And the original Alamo shut down July, June or July of 2007. And Brian couldn't come for whatever reason, so my my dad came with me, and we drove from North Carolina because they told us you could take your seats home with you at the end of the night. They like gave everybody a very tiny wrench with your ticket. Um, thankfully, a very enterprising gentleman brought a drill with him, but uh, we ripped out the seats that we sat in. It was a triple feature. Uh, they showed uh, Big Night, which is an amazing film, and had a you know four course feast. Uh, they showed Earthquake, and they brought in a bunch of extra speakers trying to recreate the sense around sound that uh, the Earthquake was released with. And then the final film uh, was the final Weird Wednesday at the original Alamo. It was uh, Night Warning, which is also known as Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. And Susan Tyrell was there, and she was so drunk. And um, it was uh, it was an amazing experience, honestly. It was a really, really incredible experience. But then, you know, like two or three months later, Brian and I had been talking and was like, oh, we still have these two badges for Fantastic Fest. Do you want to like take a week off and just go to Austin for Fantastic Fest? So this was Fantastic Fest three. This was their third year. Um, And we went and just had an incredible time. You know, the closing night film that year was uh, was a secret and it was There Will Be Blood. Paul Thomas Anderson was there. You know, he came to the after party and I really, really wanted to talk to him because I was a huge fan. And I just kind of waited. I was really shy. But I waited until he was kind of done talking to people and kind of standing off by himself. And so I went up and I asked him a couple of questions and we had a very nice little conversation. And he literally got done talking to me and like turned and walked off down uh, like 6th Street in Austin, just kind of into the mist. And it was a very like magical, <laughs> mythical experience for me. Nobody ever um, heard from him again. Yeah, no, poor guy. It's a shame. But yeah, so I mean, that was that was, uh, you know, a big experience for both of us. And we decided to move to Austin and. You know, just got very lucky. You know, I met, you know, Scott Weinberg, who would, uh, was a big critic and still is, obviously. Um, and he introduced me to Tim League, who is the, you know, the co-founder and owner of the Alamo. And Tim was just like, hey, you know, I'm watching screeners for Fantastic Fest next, next week. Do you want to come by and watch them with me? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, it's. It sucks because I know people, oftentimes people will ask you how you got into something with the hopes of there'll be some like path for you to to do the same thing. And I think for a lot of us, we just kind of fell into what we're doing. And that's very true for me. You know, I just was very lucky to to be in the right place at the right time and, you know, to be able to kind of parlay that into uh, a, a long career of doing this. 
Well, let me let me push back on that just a little bit because I think I think a lot of the decisions you make, right? Like a lot of the film industry runs on kind of of uh, social stuff. It's we don't think of it as a particularly heavy networking industry because we like to think that writers and talent and stuff just sort of shine forth. But it's like any business, you know, who you speak to and when you speak to them puts you gives you more opportunities than not. So let me ask you this then, as somebody who is in the right room to have the right conversations to turn this into a career, what are some what are places you recommend people be? You know, obviously go to film festivals, but are there are there sort of social events? Are there are there types of work and things that that young aspiring programmers, it's kind of those the, the the kind of friendships and relationships and business connections they should be making? Is there stuff that you're like, man, you definitely? I don't know if I can help you get a programming career, but definitely like go to this festival, attend this like CinemaCon thing, like do this other thing. Where do you where do you find that those best kind of conversations happen? I mean, I, you know, in the year of our Lord 2021, I feel like a lot of those conversations are happening on social media. And even back then, to an extent, they were. I mean, Scott obviously was always really big into Twitter and still is. And, you know, I, I know I know I, I I honestly don't remember where I first met Scott. Um, but, you know, especially in the, you know, the pre-COVID years and then, you know, the, you know, to that whatever you want to call it, like 2005 through 2015, going to film festivals was a big was certainly a big deal and you could meet a lot of people there. And, and um, a lot of them were like, Scott, we're, we're very open and, and, you know, wanted to talk to people and wanted to, you know, talk to like-minded people, you know, as you know, fant- you know, fantastic fest was, you know, small at the time for sure, you know, and um, a sort of niche, you know, this is a, with the, the type of programming uh, that we champion, you know, was, was certainly not, not even really big on the festival circuit at the time. And so, you know, finding like-minded people that were like, yeah, let's go watch Joe Lynch's wrong turn too. You know, that was, that was not going to play at Sundance, you know, for mm-hmm. example. So, but yeah, to answer your question, I, you know, I think a lot of that is happening on social media these days where, you know, people find like-minded people and find people that like, you know, that same kind of niche genre content that they like on Twitter and on yeah, I'm probably Twitter more than Facebook, I guess. I don't know. I'm not. I, maybe the kids are on TikTok these days. Who's to say? I couldn't tell you how to do TikTok. The future programmers of the world all on TikTok right now. Probably so, man. Well, let me ask you about the the business side of things, too, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Because I think at least as somebody who's you know kind of involved enough to kind of see some stuff, I feel like we're having these proliferation of regional and um, subject matter film festivals that's just so amazing. There's a million genre festivals, and that's incredible. But then you're also seeing, you know, the increasing competition for premieres and that studios, um, producers are at least anecdotally to me more involved in kind of manufacturing the journey that a lot of these films are taking in order to put it in the best place to succeed. So all of these kind of like evolutions and changes of the film festival scene over the last 10 years, do you walk away feeling like excited about the direction? Do you walk away being like, all right, this is going to go the way of the movie theater itself at some point? Where do you sit with this stuff? I mean, I hope not. I hope it doesn't doesn't go away because I think there's still, I mean, even, it, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, a film that, that didn't make it into Fantastic Fest, unfortunately, but I think it did play, play Fright Fest. But, you know, there's so many films that don't even make it in that, you know, the idea of, you know, film festivals going away is terrifying to me because, the, you know, it's like there are levels, you know, you have Eternals or something that plays 4,000 screens and everybody in the world's heard of it. And then you have like, I don't know, House of Gucci that's still like, all right, it's an art house film, but people have heard of it. And then you have like festival circuit titles and like, I don't know, let's like, let's say South by for an example. I think South by plays something like 115 to 120 features per year and they get somewhere in the neighborhood of like six or 7,000 submissions. So, I mean that, you know, even just the titles that play South by are already a level above, you know, then you have like, you know, another whatever 5,000, 900 submissions that didn't get in and of those like some are like the movie we're going to talk about today which i you know i think are kind of gems in the rough so the idea of like cutting out that (laughs) that mid-tier level where you're already above so many other films is terrifying to me you know i I love the idea that we have so many festivals that are playing so many of these movies because they they deserve to to have a spotlight shown on them yeah there's so many movies out there that like will succeed just by proving it themselves and again like their marketing we talk about the eternals mcu like marketing will always be taken by the bigger studios marketing will always be taken up by the studios with money 
and a movie like Tigers Not Afraid or just like so many we could list off that have played fantastic in Fantasia, they need to go find their audiences first. But once they do, like they become the biggest hits. And, and that is just based on talent itself. You know, as much money you can throw at a movie to make people go see it, there are still many of those movies that are made independently and they're made by just passionate creators that need an outlet like that. So like, yeah, like the thought, the thought to me of that going away is just so disheartening because there are so many movies we've even talked about on this podcast that don't have distro yet. And we will again, talk about one of those today, but like it comes talking about that playing Fantasia and how that hasn't gotten anywhere yet. Like right. there needs to be an outlet for those films to find their audience. And I very much hope it does not go the way of the Dodo, uh, these festivals. <laughs> right. Because, uh, because what you're saying is true. There is a market for these titles. Like right. there are people that eat these up and, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm, on payroll for shutter because I'm not, but I think what shutter does is so great because it does give a place for these titles to get out there and you see stuff on shutter blow up, you know, especially on, uh, you know, on Twitter, you can go and watch like, you know, something hits shutter, something like take host, for example, you know, host hits shutter in the middle of the pandemic and everybody's like, Holy fuck. What is this movie? It's amazing. Um, so I love that the, the, the guys at shutter, are looking for those titles are excited about those titles and are really pushing those titles because you, like you said, there is a, there's an, a rabid audience out there for them. Yeah. And especially, you know, if we talk about shutter specifically, what they do is so interesting because it's not going to land. Uh, sorry. every film is not going to land with every audience. I mean, re- we recently, we had a Twitter DM conversation about the medium and I'm like, I love this. It's going to make, <laughs> it's going to make my top 10. And you're like, Oh no. <laughs> like, but that is, it, that is the amazing part of all this again. And the experience is, there are audiences for every single movie and a, a distributor like shutter wants to give all of those audiences their movie, even though they know it's not going to be as widely acclaimed where the big studios are trying to go for like, we have to appeal to the masses. That's kind right. of, we have to hit all four quadrants. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, part of what sets shutter aside from other streaming services is the curation idea. And, and frankly, the fact that they have, you know, Colin Geddes who programmed midnight madness for Toronto for a long time and Sam Zimmerman, uh, who's been in the the horror criticism game for a long time, and those those guys are both incredibly intelligent um, and very uh, very talented guys that are a huge asset to Shutter. So even if I disagree with Sam more often than not, I love him to death. Well, you mentioned today's film, so I think this is going to be our opportunity to to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the movie that Luke picked for us a little a little film. Um, that I like to call because it's the title, There Are Monsters. So we'll be right back. Hey, so... I want to say thank you, everybody, for listening to this week's episode of Certified Forgotten. We know it's been a while. We do. We do. The holidays are a busy time. And of course, for us, we include you know the entire month of October as part of the holidays. But we do want to say thank you so much for, um, you know, for supporting the podcast. But more importantly, thank you for supporting the website. Um, even when the there's a lull in us recording these episodes, you're still going to find really kick-ass content on www.certifiedforgotten.com. Yeah, we started with the podcast out of a passion and curiosity and just to see what happened, but the site has become our bread and butter, and especially since we opened the Patreon, that is where we're always going to sell it. Uh, you know, put ourselves first, I guess, to say. Sell that first, I was going to say, but, you know, we're not really selling anything anymore. Everyone knows what it is. You know what uh, certifiedforgotten.com is, and... We're just uh, really proud of that. So, And we're also happy that you'll still stick around for more episodes when we do get back into this. So whatever may happen, we may go away for a month or two. Who knows? However long it takes to recalibrate our lives in this great unknown world that we're in. But uh, we're always going to come back. So we appreciate that as well. Yeah. And we do have, I mean, we always have some pretty excellent guests lined up. So trust us, when we start to hit our stride again, we come out of the little rough patch we had. You're going to be really pleased with the quality of the content you're getting. And also, I will make more sense when I talk on future episodes because I have my <laughs> two shots in me right now between the booster and the flu shot. So I hope my words make sense in this little interlude. You know what? There's our takeaway. For those that are listening, get your vaccines, get your boosters. It's a good idea. If Donato can get a booster and still record this episode and write probably a thousand words today on other various things, you got no excuse. Booster, flu shot, and a Death Valley review. And I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> There it is. 
Well, thank you guys again for listening. We're not going to keep Donato from getting back to bed. Uh, enjoy the episode. Let's uh, let's get back into what Mr. Mullen has to say about the movie of choice. All right, welcome back. So today on the show, we're going to be talking about a film called There Are Monsters. There Are Monsters is a 2013 feature written and directed and produced and edited and scored by Canadian filmmaker Jay Dahl. It's based on his 2008 short film of the same name, and it follows a group of college students on the road as they shoot a series of alumni photos for the university. Somewhere along the way, though, the group begins to realize the people they encounter just seem wrong. Their smiles are too big, their memories are too spotty, and before long, our heroes realize that something terrible has begun. So Luke, normally we start by saying, hey guest, why did you bring us this feature? But I'm curious because you you uh, gave us an opportunity to see the film, but you also gave us an opportunity to see the short that the film was based off. So did you watch the short before you saw the feature? Or did you did you come to it the other way around? Yeah, no, I, I wasn't aware of the short uh, really until I got there. So there is a UK DVD. It's super hard to see this film, unfortunately, uh, which is probably why it has less. I tried to look on Rotten Tomatoes, but it's like has an internal server error right now, but certainly less, certainly less. I think I had like three reviews when I looked. So yeah, it's super hard to see this title. There is a UK DVD if you want to track it down. Obviously it is in PAL and region locked. So you know you will need to be region free, but you should be region free anyway, because there's a lot of great cinema out there. Um, but no, so I saw this uh, as a submission. Uh, I saw the feature as a submission for Fantastic Fest back in 2014. So yeah, I was unaware of the short actually completely until I got the DVD and it was a special feature on the short. And I was like, oh, so I actually watched the short for the first time today. Um, but it's really interesting. Like I actually, like, I like the short, a lot of the, a lot of the things that you, that I really like about the feature are present in the short. Um, some of the same, uh, actors and actresses are there. And actually like, uh, I think it looks to me like, uh, like the whole sequence with the convenience score clerk, like all of her shots are from the short, just edited into the feature, it which is matter. interesting. Yeah. Cause I didn't pick up on that at all. Like it didn't look out of place or odd or anything the first time watching the film. So it was really interesting to go back and go like, Oh yeah, that's not the same convenience store. And these are completely different reverse shots cut into the cut into the film. I mean, if, if you've got gold, you like, you, you keep the gold and just yeah. repurpose it. Like, that's, no, you, you do. Cause she's make... great. Like yeah. she is great. She has like the creepy smile down to a science. Yeah. She is. She is big teeth and dead eyes in terms of what she's able to do with that. So definitely keep an actress like that. Um, what made this kind of stand out for you and what is kind of what, I mean, first of all, you said this is hard to get, what made you go out and get a copy of this film, have to order it from outside of the United States. And I know that for a lot of horror fans and genre fans, like ordering films from, you know, other, other countries where they happen to be released is like, that's, it's, it's just your Sunday. Yeah. It's just what you do. Yeah. It feels like it still felt like, like probably there was an effort involved in getting this one. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I actually ended up getting it off eBay because I think Amazon UK didn't have it anymore. I mean, I should have bought it a long time ago because I really, really like this film. Um, and I, I'm actually really sad that we didn't end up playing it. But I mean, ultimately, I got it for you guys because I wanted you to be able to see it. And, uh, you know, it wasn't it, it's not available anywhere, you know, streaming or for purchase. It's just the, U, the UK DVD is pretty much it if you want to see this movie. So yeah, as far as like, you know, why did I go buy the DVD? I, I, I bought it for you. Aww. But really, I do love this. And it's, it's funny because, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys have this, but you, you know, you'll have, a, you'll have an idea of a film in your head and you'll kind of be almost afraid to rewatch it because what if you were wrong <laughs> or what if your tastes have changed or what if the world, you know, any number of things could have happened. And I've had that, you know, where I've had a film that I was really, really excited about and then I go back and watch it again and it's like, oh, I was wrong. So I was super, I, I actually just watched it like an hour, like I just finished before this podcast. Um, so I watched it in the middle of the day with the lights on, you know, and it's still, to me at least, I think this film is still really affecting. Um, I think it's super effective at what it's trying to do. And it's, you know, this is a low budget Canadian movie that never went anywhere. Like it's rough around the edges. It does, 
you know, it probably leans too much on the handheld. It leans too much on the, you know, out of focus, can't really tell what's going on. Um, but I think there are a lot of things in its favor. Um, I think the acting is really strong for, you know, a bunch mm-hmm. of people that you've never seen or heard of. Like I, I buy that world. Like I buy everything that they're selling me. Um, and I think that's that in and of itself sets it uh, above a lot of the submissions you see in the festival world. I think the score is really effective. You know, you mentioned that Jay did that himself. Obviously this is a low budget film. He did a lot of this stuff. He did a bunch of the effects work himself, but I think that sets it apart. I think it does a really good job of building tension and atmosphere. Um, I mean, I, I think you guys both mentioned that, that the, the first jump scare in the movie got you both. I think it oh, gets yeah. everyone because you're not expecting it. And it's so fast and weird and creepy. And I think that just sets the tone for the film so well. I love that this film doesn't do that thing that so many found footage movies do where it like gives you title cards about who the people are and the footage was found here or there or whatever. It doesn't do that shit. Like it drops you in and it's like, here we go. And it actually does something that kind of ups that not, not, not upsets me, but can be frustrating in other films where it shows you a scene from, you know, like 20 or 30 minutes later in the film and then backs up to, to start the film. And I think that that, is often a crutch and can often not really work well, but I think it's so effective in this film to set the tone really early and let you know what you're in for. Um, And then I think it's super well paced. Like I think the buildup is really strong to get you where you're going to like the, the sequence with uh, when they're in the motel and the lady comes in from, from next door. Mm. I think that whole sequence is so great for like, Holy shit, this is real. This is real. This is real. Oh, maybe it's not real. Like it, it plays with your expectations really well. And yeah, like I just, it's, I, you know, sitting here watching it in 2021 at, you know, one in the afternoon, it was still creepy. Like it's, and that, that in and of itself, I think is an accomplishment. Well, and I think I'll play off of the creepy aspect there uh, because I had the same watching experience. I watched it today when I woke up and literally it's like 10 o'clock and I just roll over and open my laptop and throw this thing on. And within the first minute, I have that like jump scare in my face that I am in no way expecting, uh, you know. I think scares especially, and we're, if we're talking about independent cinema and we're talking about things that like, you know, didn't even play a festival because that means like some of the other programmers didn't feel the same way that you felt about it. Scares kind of come last. I feel like a lot of those indie horror films do a lot better with creating dread and tension and character driven drama and scares don't actually work as well because they're on tight budgetary restraints. But the fact of the matter is that like I jumped in bed, not expecting this immediate scare out the gate and that's as you just said that sets the tone for everything else and that kind of makes everything else a little scarier because i'm already apprehensive now my anxiety levels are spiked and i know that they're going to throw this at me again because if you have the cojones to like literally do that to an audience in the first minute or two then you're gonna keep doing it and that like that constant nagging in the back of my head made this a little bit more dreadful the entire time and it, I will admit that there were some issues I, I thought with the uh, fake documentary angle, but then again, I thought about the movie a little bit longer and like they did one thing that is my biggest pet peeve. And you have one character running down a road who's not holding a camera. And yet we're seeing different angles and shots of the character. But then I thought more about it and we do have a scene quite early on where the documentary crew goes in to talk to like their teacher or something and uh, they they specifically call out the fact that they have three cameras. So they immediately say, we have three cameras. We're going to be able to give you different angles. So I'm able to do that, whereas a, a movie like Paranormal Activity Next of Kin, which is a much bigger movie with a bigger budget, literally tells you they have one camera and then continually sh- like shoots everything in multiple fucking views. And you're right. like, okay, so if the little indie movie that is able to do these things right is like setting the groundwork and yet these other bigger movies that like can't even figure out how found footage works. It's just really impressive. And I'll also say the smile gag to me, like we've seen the smile gag so many times at this point, like for people listening, it's an invasion of body snatch scenario. And you knew, you know, it's a body snatch when the character grins huge and right. Right. Well, we've all, I, I don't know. Uh, well, and like what, truth, like truth or dare? I was just going to say, yeah, okay, this yeah. is the precursor to truth or dare in so many <laughs> ways. And it's like, it still looks better here than it does on a Blumhouse budget. 
Well, and what I love about it is that it it generally is quick. Like it doesn't linger on it. It doesn't. It almost doesn't even give you enough time to see it. And I don't know if you guys notice, but a lot of times it looks like they're doing that in the background. Like you'll see like somebody out of focus in the background, and their face will change, and you'll be like, "Wait, what the fuck was that?" Um, but I also love that it's not always the same. Like when they're in the dentist office, and uh, you know the the bigger guy with the beard sees the dad do it. It's it's different. It's almost like it starts in the middle and it's almost like a symmetrical, like weird. Yeah. So it, mm-hmm. it, it's not always the same thing, which I appreciate too. So it, I think it's interesting that you brought up paranormal activity. Cause I was, I was looking into this a little more. Um, so like you said, the short was in 2008, but they were actually making the feature. They started shooting the feature in 2008 and then it took him, you know, like four or five years of post-production before he started submitting to festivals. So it says 2013, but this movie was shot in 2008 which makes a lot more sense when you see the guy with the very obvious first iPhone yeah, and stuff like that. It's like, okay, so it was 2008. So then you go back and think about that. And it's like paranormal activity didn't, it says 2007 on IMDb because it played festivals in 2007, but this paranormal activity didn't hit DVD until 2009. So like this was shooting well before the guy would have had a, an opportunity to see paranormal activity, which to me, I think, is a big deal because there is so much of this that feels inspired by, you know, it, it, you watching it in 2021, you're like, yeah, I've seen stuff like this before. And it's like, yeah, but this guy hadn't like when yeah. he was making this, like that didn't exist yet, you know? And so a lot of this, I think you need to give him maybe more credit for than you would just because of where it actually took place, you know, historically, as far as the world goes and what other films were out there at the time. Cause like the, you know, even the, the, you know, the phone gag, like the, like, let's take a picture. Like, I don't remember the first time that was done, but like, it feels like that's been done a lot now, but at the time it hadn't really, I guess is my point. Or at least I don't think it had. I was just going to say that was exactly what I was going to bring up. It feels like a precursor, not only to truth or dare, not only the paranormal activity next of kin in the way that it contrasts so to desperately, but it is a precursor in the way that you just said that, that shot in the basement where they're using the iPhone light and like the shutter closes and it can't load the picture until like a few seconds so like you which the, the iphone and, did like if yeah. you had an original iphone it definitely did that shit sometimes where it was just like oh i, I don't have enough processing power to handle this right now <laughs> and it's just a, a beautiful way to be like I, I don't know we can look at a film and we can be like oh so we could so easily just be like well that's a lazy rip off that's this xyz and that and like you just brought out no that's not true this guy had not seen any found footage beforehand because we really have to we really have to give the credit to paranormal activity even though blair witch was so much earlier but like paranormal activity created the boom like it wasn't the found footage boom until really the paranormal activity took off so as you just said this guy had no context for most of the scares he was throwing in there and he was doing things that people would do years later and become just such a found footage staple and it that means so much that does mean so much because this guy's ideas we're predating so many things. And if someone looks at just the 2014 release date, like, oh, of course, he's just doing another blah, blah, blah. Like, no, he's not. He's actually doing things first. And we have to we have to give that credit a little bit. That's interesting because I, I found myself thinking a lot um, as I was watching the film and knowing that it was that he was working on it around the same time period actually makes me appreciate this anymore. It reminded me a lot of The Signal, um, the Canadian film, sure, yeah. I think 2007, 2008. It's an anthology film that deals with the same idea of sort of like, in, in that case, a technology induced apocalypse. But it has a lot of the same vibes in terms of the way that the people are engaging with the world around them, the way that the people that have been replaced or are, um, you know, consumed by by the signal are, are sort of acting. And it's it's they're they're both of a piece in that they're definitely they're definitely 70s throwbacks, not 80s throwbacks, I think, which is interesting. They're dealing with paranoia films. They're dealing with Invasion of the Body Snatchers and the remakes without kind of the gore that we would like. If you made this movie now, of course, you'd like crank it up to 11, right? This would be like blood and body parts everywhere because you would be kind of engaging with your own nostalgia as a filmmaker for a period when they were doing a lot of like monster movies like this. But it is sort of by design a lot more of like a slow burn paranoia thriller And it does the thing that I like more than anything in a horror movie, which is where it gives us one good scientific idea. Like, fuck, just one. It gives us Capgras syndrome, which is the idea that like a real medical syndrome where people believe that the loved ones have been replaced because they have the lesions in their brain prevent them from being able to actually, you know, recognize and process the visual appearance of their friends as family members. 
And I love it when a movie's like, oh, I have like one good idea. And like, I heard it, like, it always feels like I heard it in a class once and like, I wrote it down and I learned everything that I needed to know about it in that class. So I'm just going to like run it and take it in whatever direction I want. But it gives this just a little bit of like a real world grounding to stand on that makes everything a bit more effective because it has that right, like coda, like real science, real technology coda that makes you like, okay, this is a thing. Like it's building on something that exists in some way, shape or form in the real world. Totally. And, you know, part of what I, you know, to go back to the gore for a minute, you know, part of what I like is that it is very judicious, but the the very few moments that it has, like the lady, you know, throwing up in the bank, I think is, is pretty effective. And then, you know, in the ad, obviously I think if you're at all interested in this movie, please track down the DVD and watch it like 20 minutes ago before we started analyzing <laughs> everything. But if you could go back in time. Uh, but you know, when they're in the attic and there's the, you know, the two kids like eating the guy's arms off like that, like they're not, these are not huge effect shots. You know, they're not, there's not a ton of money behind them, but, but I do think that they feel real within the film. Does that make sense? Like I, I, they feel realistic in the film and I buy them more than, you know, so much shitty, you know, CG that you see in a lot of, um, you know, a lot of let's call them lesser horror movies. I, I don't mean to shit on any other movies, but just, you know, we've all seen stuff where you're like, eh, I don't really buy that. And you know, right. these are gooey and drippy and practical and, you know, maybe you've seen stuff that looked better, but maybe not for that money. Like <laughs> this guy had like 20 bucks in a dream. Yeah. The, the, uh, the vomit scene, especially when the old woman behind the counter and uh, she basically upchucks the entity inside her. It, it is right. gr- like it, it's gooey. Gooey is the word. Like it's, <laughs> it's so gooey. It's so gross. And it does work in that context because everything is just mo- sorry. Most things are just grossly practical and you just have the vision of her just like spitting out what that thing is and a different colored saliva is just like dripping down and she's like kind of smiling and laughing as it's <laughs> as happening at the end. Like that is so unsettling like that again, like, it's such a short moment. And what you said about it being judicious, that's exactly how a, that's how indie filmmaking like kind of should work. You don't have the money to pull it off often. So you pick your spots and you win those right. small battles. And, and, they, and they tease it with the kid's lunch, you know, the yeah. kid with the, you know, mm-hmm. weird. And it's like the whatever's packaged, like, that's fine. That's probably liver or something you can pick up easily. But like the little hair bit that looks like, I don't know, a mouse has been scalped or something yeah. like because there's still like there's I don't know. I don't mean to like gush, but I just think gush, it's really gush. I think it, I think it's really well done. Like, I think it's super effective. And, I you know, I I wish that uh, that this was maybe more widely seen and appreciated because i think there's a lot of really cool stuff here the arm bit like sorry i just for one second like the arm bit that you mentioned as well luke that is a visual i will remember and again we're talking about a movie that was made for no money and whether or not it sustains even i I, like have i seen better films overall in the quality package yes i have like i think some of the lines are kind of clunky i think it does use shaky cam a little too much for a footage film but there is still so much in here that is good. And I am positive on like, I am overall positive on it just in general, because you have a moment like the two children devouring this human standing almost in like a Christ pose, just standing there. And the two kids are on one arm. Each has basically their mouth up to it's the guy's forearm, like a snake. And yeah. there is no, like there's no bad angle on it. It, it takes a few angles on that shot and there's no wrong way to look at it. It just looks good in every single moment of that. And it just boggles my mind because or do some of the faces even look a little wonky? Yes, they do. Like, it's digital effects on the crazy alien faces. But I, th- I think that's really endearing. Like, I love yeah. the crazy faces. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, and the speed of it. You mentioned that before. Yeah, like, oh, it's so quick. The speed is perfect. But yeah, yeah. so, I, I mean, there are a, one or two shots for me that are just the digital composition that sure. gets thrown away. But... Again, though, you get the one that matters right. You get that one moment so right. And that's what sets a movie like that apart. Because, I don't know, other indie filmmakers, and we've all seen how many festival submissions. And, of course, Luke, you've seen quadruple the amount that me and Mono have seen. (laughs) And a lot of other indie filmmakers don't really understand that. They just think more, 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 and we'll try to do what we can with the money we have. No. Pick your battles. Win those moments. That's what lasts. So I just really quickly about that scene, because um, Monaco, you were talking about like having a basis in science. And when I watched it this time, so right before that, you know, they're talking to the family and the little kid said something to the grandpa that I didn't quite hear. So I had to back it up and put the subtitles on. And what he says is, yeah, mitosis, which is, you know, cell division cells replicating themselves. 
And they're like, because it's in response to the the lady looking at the the two kids with the arms and asking what is going on. And the little kid's like, oh, it's mitosis, which I think is just, it's just sort of a throw in, but I like it in that same context that Monica was talking about, about like having a basis in science. It's like, oh, they're replicating. They're in the other room replicating right now. Um, and, and one more thing I wanted to point out as, as far as like setting it above the pack, you see so many films, you know, submissions or otherwise that are really, really good until the end. And I, I call it sticking the landing. So many films don't stick the landing. And while I, I'm sort of half and half on the moment when they cut to credits, I mean, I think it's a clever line break, but the bus scene that they actually yeah. end on, I think the bus scene that they end on is so great. And I think it really does stick the landing. And to me, that in and of itself elevates this film above so many other films that are like this, where you're like on board, on board, on board, and then it gets to the end and just kind of shits the bed. This one sticks the landing. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think I really enjoyed the first hour. I think there was about 20 minutes after that where I'm like, I don't know if you have what it takes to pull off the vision of the world falling apart. Yeah. But then they nail it in like that last little bit. Um, but I, I think the thing that, that I found myself thinking, of, especially at the end, and it's perfect that you set up to talk about the ending, is like, all right, this is a, every science fiction and horror film is like, oh, it's an allegory for our times or whatever. Like, yes, fine, your neighbors are being subsumed and they're becoming these different things you don't know who they are like fine yes that's a that's a parallel for our times but I, as i was watching i couldn't get out of my head um a gra like a uh, a meme that somebody had shared on social media the other day which they were basically it was a venn diagram of like the world is ending i'm going to work and they were like how did we end up here in the middle and like this movie perfectly encapsulates like these creatures take us over and then they just fucking do our jobs Right, yeah, they're they're just drive, driving the bus. Nothing change, like everything changes and nothing changes. And I was just like, it's such a mundane and awful vision of the apocalypse that, in a lot of ways, I responded to this as a better apocalyptic film for our specific point in time than ninety nine percent of the other stuff that I've watched. Because like everything is awful and nothing changed. And usually there's some big transfer. The world has ended or something. It's like no, it's like it's all the same. It's just like so much worse. And you're like, that's it. That's the message. That's the thing we got to leave our, our children with, with, uh, you know, there are monsters is, is that's the, the world that they're inheriting in the world we're living in. <laughs> so I loved, and that bus stinger is perfect because like, you know, it's just, they're going to work and they're reading books and they're like learning French and yep, but they're also <laughs> like evil. And you're just like, yep. Okay. Yep. Fair enough. I love it. Well, I think we could talk about this film for pretty much forever. Um, and I, I regret that we can't, um, Luke, especially. Hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to bring this conversation in person at a future festival because I, I do want to hear you gush a little bit more about this movie. Um, but I want to end kind of on the last note that we always do, which is the discovery process or the rediscovery uh, about a movie like There Are Monsters. You know, this exists on one disc, maybe literally one. You might even have the only copy of this movie. <laughs> it exists on one disc that was released in Europe. Um, what allow what what kind of scenario can you see this movie ever gaining the audience that you think it serves? What's the scenario that this movie finds its people? Uh, you know, hopefully somebody will listen to this and want to track down the DVD. Um, but I mean, I, th I think the ideal scenario would be, you know, somebody like Shutter picks it up for streaming and, and its people find it. Like, look, this, this movie's never going to be a huge movie. Like th hundreds of thousands of people are probably never going to watch this film. But I think that there is an audience out there of, you know, people that listen to this podcast, people that are like us, people that, that love those smaller festival titles that maybe that nobody's really heard of these kind of diamonds in the rough. Like there, there's an audience for something like this. And, you know, if, if there's a, if there's a wish or a hope or something for it to really find that audience, I, you know, I think it has to, you know, it has to become available on some kind of streaming or rental service in the States. Donato, I assume you and I are going to go with Tubi or Shutter as we always do. Our Lord and Savior Tubi needs to pick this up. <laughs> Our Lord and Savior of, of the streaming world. Uh, no, I just I agree with what you know Luke kind of said. It's going to have a small audience, but it has to find that niche. And I also think what people are doing over like Vinegar Syndrome or like Brad Henderson starting Terror Vision, even like they're they're focusing on those smaller films that haven't got releases yet, and they're saying, no, we're going to give it a release. I, I mean, you know, they have one upcoming that. I, I can't wait for people to see because it was the first movie I ever reviewed at Fantastic Fest. And that was in 2014. So it's like they're going back and releasing things like like this, like they are like these are the kind of t titles they're releasing because they believe as much as we do that these need an audience. 
Um, and I think those audiences do exist and they deserve to get a movie like this. And I, if we tell Mary Beth McAndrews about this movie, she will go crazy about it because yes. like, wait, a found footage movie I haven't seen yet. Like I need to see this. And right there, that's how you start getting that groundswell started a little bit. So the method for getting eyes on a movie of this is hard. It's a lot harder than getting eyes on even, uh, you know, we did the Poughkeepsie tapes because it's like, holy shit, how did that movie have under five Rotten Tomatoes reviews? But everyone in the horror sphere knows about it. Like everyone knows that title. So this is a little bit harder where again, like Luke, you can even get it to play fan- fantastic because you had other programmers you had to like kind of work with. So it's like, there's, you know, there's, there's things that go along with that. Sure. I mean, it, it, you know, it did, it looks like it did play Fright Fest and also yeah. Bishan and South Korea. So, I mean, it did get a festival life and, you know, yeah. programming is, it's a weird game. Like yeah. there's, I was actually looking back through my emails to see maybe what happened with it, but, um, Ultimately, it didn't make it in, which is a shame, but um, but I'm excited and hopeful that, you know, maybe some people will be aware of it after listening to this. So thank you guys cool. so much for, for having me on and for letting me gush a little bit. I appreciate it. Yeah, we will cross our fingers that someday this, <laughs> this is going to sound like faint praise, I promise it's not, that someday this movie gets the 1,000 or 5,000 DVD release that it deserves, <laughs> which is like, which is the, the economics of sure, uh, yeah. independent film distribution. So it's not a knock on the movie. Well, Luke, we want to say thank you so much for for joining us on the show. It was great that you brought us something that we could have such a fun conversation about. And obviously, we will see you sooner rather than later. Probably me a little bit sooner than Donato. What uh, for the for the people that are out there that want to kind of keep an eye on the various projects that you've got going on, or just kind of get your movie thoughts in general? Do you have a letterbox? I know you're a little <laughs> active on Twitter. Is there a good place for for people to to check? kind of check you out and see what you're watching and getting excited by yeah twitter's twitter is the best i'm uh, at ld mullen on twitter m-u-l-l-e-n uh i don't do a letterbox just because it's you know i most of what i watch is submissions that i can't really talk about right then so it's just it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to keep mm-hmm. up with a letterbox um but yeah if, if you if you want to come talk to me on twitter feel free Donato, how do people talk to you on social media? You can find me everywhere. I'm plugged in uh, at Donato Bomb on Twitter, Letterboxd, and Instagram. Uh, every Friday, live streaming on Perry Nemiroff's YouTube channel for the Merry Hour. And uh, yeah, just read my writing. That's going to appear everywhere this December from Slash Film to Bloody to some new sites that I will post. And uh, yeah, we're just going to keep on rocking. Remember, if you see Donato standing outside your window with his back turned to your house, it's just his way of saying, I've got some film criticism I want you to read. As for myself, you can find me on uh, on Twitter. Um, I am Matt Monagle at Twitter. I recently changed that, so it took me a second to remember. But um, yeah, I think we would always encourage you also to check out the website, certifiedforgotten.com. We've got a redesign that's in the works that will happen in the next two months or so that we're really excited about. But Um, Donato went fishing for some killer Christmas horror criticism and by gum he found some so keep checking back you're not going to want to miss the stuff that we're going to post and that is it for this show be sure to check out Luke Mullen's stuff he can't talk about a lot of it but he'll share what he can be sure to check out Donato's stuff I write sometimes too mostly about board games these days it feels like a good transition for me I guess we'll catch you on the other side thanks so much Luke keep it going (laughs) 